tell God all of my troubles when I get home. Hello, and welcome to the History of Africana Philosophy by G.K. Jeffers and Peter Adamson, brought to you with the support of the King's College London Philosophy Department and the LMU in Munich, online at historyofphilosophy.net. Today's episode, Race First, Then Party, T. Thomas Fortune. Imagine, if you can, a version of the United States in which black people vote almost unanimously for the Republican Party, and newspapers are the most powerful force shaping public opinion. Actually, you don't have to imagine it, but only look back into history, because both were the case in late 19th century America. We've had plenty of reason to mention newspapers already. The fight for abolition was waged by such organs as William Lloyd Garrison's Liberator and Frederick Douglass's North Star. Less famous names were also getting in on the act, like John Russworm and Samuel Cornish, who founded Freedom's Journal, and Mary Ann Shad up in Canada with her paper, The Provincial Freeman. Even those who were not involved in the newspaper business had their remarks and ideas disseminated by newspapers, with Sojourner Truth being the most obvious example. Like so many other things in 19th century America, the press was divided by a color line. There was a Negro press, which spoke to the concerns of African Americans. Already by 1880, there were about 30 black newspapers in the country, and they had plenty of injustices to report, even if slavery had been ended during the Civil War. These included the rise of lynching, the lack of economic opportunity for freed slaves, and legal setbacks, such as the Supreme Court decision that declared it unconstitutional to legislate against segregation. The Civil Rights Act of 1875 had forbidden racial discrimination in hotels, public transport, theaters, and so on, but the court struck this down. They ruled that even if the 13th Amendment to the Constitution had abolished slavery, mere discriminations on account of race or color were not regarded as badges of slavery. As one observer trenchantly remarked, this was effectively a reassertion of the implication of the infamous Dred Scott case that the black man has no rights that a white man is bound to respect. That observer's name was T. Thomas Fortune, writing in a newspaper he edited called the New York Globe. Under a variety of names, including The Freeman and The New York Age, under Fortune's editorship, this paper would survive until 1960. In recognition of his work on this and other periodicals, another newspaper said that Fortune was without peer or superior as a colored journalist, and after his death he was hailed as the best developed journalist that the Negro race has produced in the Western world. But the word journalist may be misleading. He was not in the business of getting inside sources to spill secrets, interviewing politicians, or exposing scandals. In his hands, a newspaper, especially its editorial page, was the tool of a polemicist, or to use his favorite term, agitator. There were scandals enough in open view, inequities that fortune was determined to defeat by using his pen with occasional suggestions that the sword might also be appropriate. His writings were designed to provoke outrage and determination in his readers, snapping them out of their lethargy or fatalism. This is what he had in mind when he wrote, We believe in dissatisfaction. We believe in the manifold virtues of agitation. If, as they say, politics is war by other means, then fortune pursued journalism as politics by other means. Which brings us back to that other exotic feature of 19th century America, the popularity of the Republican Party among black voters. In the 2018 congressional elections, the Republicans got only a 9% share of this demographic, but in the wake of the Civil War, the situation was the reverse. Black voters gave massive support to the Republicans, who were the party of Lincoln, and despised Democrats as a party of racists who wanted to maintain white power in the southern states. Thus, we find other black activists, not least Douglas, saying things like, the Republican Party is the ship, all else is the sea. Fortune was different. He mocked such devotion as this eternal gratitude business, arguing that political support should not be offered in recognition of past achievements, but in expectation of support in the future. Not that the Republicans' past performance impressed Fortune overmuch. Even Lincoln, he observed, freed the slaves more out of political calculation than anything else, whatever his private feelings about emancipation may have been. And no wonder, because politicians are simply the servants of public opinion. 
Since the war, the party had done little for black people, whom it treated like babies. Fortune was so disappointed by this that he at one point proposed forming a third party that would actually take an interest in race rights. This was no act of disloyalty as far as he was concerned. We have not deserted any party, he wrote. The party deserted us. Fortune was taking a financial risk with this unpopular stance. He kept his newspaper, The Globe, independent of party affiliation, despite knowing it could harm its circulation. A bold and principled move, especially for a man who, despite his name, was constantly strapped for cash. You might say that Fortune was putting his lack of money where his mouth was. Fortune laid out a lengthy defense of his stance in an 1886 pamphlet called The Negro in Politics. It presents Republican politicians as having cynically exploited the reliable support of black voters. They used our votes and flattered self-esteem just so long as our votes held out, but this political vassalage had won African Americans little real assistance. In fact, neither party cares a snap of the finger for race rights, and Republican partisans like Douglas are convicted of naivete. Partly, Fortune's polemic here is driven by tactics. Black people should make the Republicans earn their votes, and could exercise more influence by voting for both parties, if only to demonstrate that they are prepared to do so. But another factor is his understanding of what politics is all about in the first place. He ends his pamphlet with the words, Parties are nothing but the instruments of tyranny when they degenerate into machines, when they cease to represent progressive justice. It is for the people to see to it that parties conserve the public interest or submit to defeat and humiliation. Four years later, he would make a similar point, saying, Parties are not things sacred to me. They are brought into existence by men to serve certain ends, when they have fulfilled the objects for which they were created, or when they prove false to the great purpose for their creation, what further use are they? Fortune teaches us that we should support political organizations only when we can convince them to represent our beliefs and objectives, and never because we simply identify with them as our side, like fans of a sports team. If no political party could claim Fortune's allegiance, then what could? In a word, race. This pamphlet offers the motto, race first, then party, and throughout his career, Fortune consistently argued for unified action on behalf of African American interests. In the 1880s, he proposed and then helped to found the National Afro-American League, which soon fell apart but was reborn in 1898 as the National Afro-American Council. Fortune had noted that other demographic groups in America had organizations for promoting unity and to serve as a platform for political action. He was particularly inspired by the example of the Irish, whom he mentions often in his writings as another group that had suffered from oppression. Like the Irish subjects of Great Britain, he remarked, we have received everything from our country but justice. In a related move with similarly enduring resonance, Fortune argued against using the term Negroes, a term favored by many colleagues in activist circles. He preferred Afro-Americans, on analogy to Irish Americans and other groups. He defined the Afro-American people as a mixed-race group, including not just black, but also colored people, where the color in question could even be white. The fact that Afro-Americans can often, though not always, be identified visually by their skin color is actually irrelevant to their forming a subgroup of the population. What unites them is the same as what unites Irish or Italian Americans, ancestry. Thus he says, we are African in origin and American in birth, therefore, by the logic of it, Afro-Americans. Consistently with this, Fortune, who himself had an Irish grandfather, by the way, had no patience for discrimination against lighter-skinned Afro-Americans by darker-skinned ones. He had harsh words against Edward Blyden on this score, and was one of the few prominent activists publicly to support Frederick Douglass's decision to marry a white woman, Helen Pitts. As far as Fortune was concerned, censuring this kind of relationship was a violation of rights, just as much as segregation laws were. When a law prohibits a black man from marrying a white woman because of his color, it strikes at the root of natural liberty. Notice that Fortune's political thought revolves exclusively around the interests of his racial group, and the question of whether they are indeed enjoying the rights that are owed them. Apart from occasional passing remarks, he makes little or no use of Christianity in his arguments. This is in sharp contrast to most of the other 19th century figures we've looked at, 
especially such thinkers as Alexander Crummel and Sojourner Truth. Fortune actually complained about the religious education, or perhaps he would say indoctrination, to which he was subjected when he studied at Howard University in Washington, D.C. in the 1870s. He argued against rallying around religion instead of race as a unifying factor in politics. The exception that proves this rule came with the most tragic episode of Fortune's life story. In 1907, shattered by overwork, money problems, alcohol abuse, and separation from his wife, he had a mental breakdown from which it would take him years to recover. During this time, he became intensely and uncharacteristically religious, commenting, When a man has been sick in heart and head for four long months, he must get very close to his maker. His usually more irreverent attitude towards Christianity may help to explain Fortune's openness to violent resistance. We've seen how Douglas, in his more aggressive moments, was opposed by pious activists like Truth. Remember her show-stopping question, Frederick, is God dead? Fortune, by contrast, openly believed in using force against injustice, whatever the Bible might say. He put forward a rather breathtaking inversion of the golden rule. In theory, do unto others as you would have them do unto you is splendid, but in practice the philosophy of conduct is do unto others as they do unto you the sooner to make them understand that a dagger of the right sort has two edges. So, while he encouraged the defense of justice through democratic means, he was always ready to entertain the use of other, more radical means, if this failed. I believe in law and order, he said, but I believe, as a conditioned precedent, that law and order should be predicated upon right and justice, pure and simple. Likewise, while allowing that it was a good idea to use the instruments of ballot box in the courts, he stated that, if others use the weapons of violence to combat our peaceful arguments, it is not for us to run away from violence. Fortune's free talk of violence, which became still freer when he took the stage while drunk, ultimately led his colleagues in the Afro-American League to see him as a liability. This is a shame, because when it came to the ballot box and the courts, Fortune was a subtle thinker who anticipated the political struggles that were to come. He had studied the law while at Howard University and took forward the ideas of one of his professors, John Mercer Langston. Langston had distinguished between legal and social rights, Fortune would likewise contrast civil rights to social privileges. Whereas civil rights are enshrined in law, social privileges are extended to citizens only by custom and are not the business of the law or the government. An example might be that we have a civil or legal right to free speech but not a civil or legal right that anyone should pay attention to us when we speak. It's rude to ignore people when they talk to you, but it's not a crime. Fortune furthermore pointed out that civil rights, by their very nature, belong equally to every citizen, while social privilege is distributed unequally. Try walking into a fancy restaurant. If you look like a rich white person, you'll likely get a very different reception than if you look like a poor black person. This is just a fact of life, thought Fortune, and cannot be legislated away. As he put it, every citizen has a co-equal right in all benefits of government, but every citizen has not on this account a legal right to demand or expect the concession of any social privilege. The one he can force by legal process, the other he must win by conduct, position, superior abilities, affluence. The urgent question then was, which forms of equal treatment are guaranteed by right, and which have to be secured as a matter of social privilege. According to the Supreme Court, access to non-segregated public transport or education was, in Fortune's terms, a matter of social privilege, not legal right. This is why they set aside the 1875 Civil Rights Act. Fortune argued that they were wrong to do so, because the government's whole purpose was to protect the enjoyment of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. As a matter of law, the waiters at the fancy restaurant cannot be made to smile and ingratiate themselves with the poor black customer, but they do have to offer him a table. Fortune thought, however, that justice called for more than just desegregating streetcars, hotels, and schools. He believed that the whole economic system of the United States, especially in the South, needed to be overhauled in order to give the laboring class a chance at prosperity. Notice not only black laborers, but all laborers. This is the argument of his remarkable 1884 book, Black and White, Land, Labor, and Politics in the South. 
As he says in the preface, he aims to show that poverty and misfortune make no invidious distinctions of race, color, or previous condition, but wealth, unduly centralized, oppresses all alike. He takes his departure from the aforementioned conception of government and its purpose, asking, what shall we say of that government which has not power or inclination to ensure the exercise of those solemn rights and immunities which it guarantees? The American government has failed its people in this respect because it has allowed one class of citizens to exploit another for its own enrichment. This was most obvious under slavery, but has continued to be the case afterward. White and black laborers need to understand that they are jointly victimized by the way that the hereditary landlords of the South keep a grip upon the throat of Southern labor, and thus that their cause is common, that they should unite under the one banner and work upon the same platform of principles for the uplifting of labor. In terms of practical remedies, beyond the proper protection of civil rights, Fortune recommends an ambitious program of land redistribution. Actually, he considers land to be a common right, like water or air, and thus to be the property of the whole people. So it should be shared out among the laboring class equally instead of concentrated in the hands of a wealthy few. If this seems rather utopian, Fortune would say that it is still less realistic to suppose that monopolization of land can continue indefinitely without a violent reaction, an explosion of the kind that led to the French Revolution and, if that isn't frightening enough, the fall of the Roman Empire. Again, we see here his conviction that violence is an appropriate reaction to injustice. Indeed, it is an inevitable result of severe exploitation. In the meantime, though, Fortune also had some ideas about what black people should be doing to improve their own situation. He was rather scornful of the high-minded, civilizing projects envisioned by men like Alexander Cromwell. The beneficiaries of such higher learning, Fortune couldn't help noticing, often became social parasites. Instead, the race would advance through the learning of practical, economically valuable skills, which means not theology and the classics, but education suitable for the mechanic and the farmer. As you may know, these proposals resonate powerfully with those of a far more celebrated contemporary of fortunes, Booker T. Washington. And in fact, the two were close colleagues and friends, at times writing letters to one another on a daily basis. Washington was at times uncomfortable with the more fiery and irascible fortune, while fortune jibed when critics of Washington assumed that he was just a spokesman for the famous Wizard of Tuskegee. One such critic was fellow journalist William Monroe Trotter, who used his newspaper, The Guardian, to inveigh against Washington, whom he dubbed the great traitor and the Benedict Arnold of the Negro race, because he thought Washington was too willing to accommodate white power and black subjugation. Trotter also mocked Fortune as being only a me too to whatever Washington aspires to do and as furnishing whatever brains the combination needs. But this was a faulty assessment of their relationship. Out in the open, Fortune hailed Washington as the Negro Moses and only suitable successor to Douglas. Though he admitted in one public performance that Washington was a decided conservative, he hastened to add that he loves Professor Washington and places unbounded confidence in him. But behind the scenes, the two had an increasingly fractious relationship. Washington would eventually be glad to see the unpredictable Fortune step away from his work as editor and activist within the Afro-American League. The result of this sidelining and of the psychologically and financially parlous state of his later years was that Fortune remains something of a forgotten man in the history of American race relations. This is, if you'll pardon the expression, unfortunate. He deserves more credit, not only for the ideas we've presented in this episode, but also for his promotion of fellow activists like Ida B. Wells, whom he praised for her crusade against lynching. Of her, he admiringly wrote in his own paper, she has become famous as one of the few women what handles a goose quill with diamond point as handily as any of us men in newspaper work. She is smart as a steel trap, and she has no sympathy for humbug. There was at least one leading intellectual of the time, though, who was willing to give Fortune his due, Fortune himself. Writing in 1916 upon the death of Booker T. Washington and taking stock of the history of black activism in his own lifetime, Fortune discerned three phases in that history. The leading figure was initially Frederick Douglass, but his prominence came to a sudden end in 1884 because of his interracial marriage. More than 30 years later, 
Fortune still rankles at the absurdity of the hostility that's provoked. Next came what Fortune calls the Afro-American period of leadership, in which he himself played a central role through his journalism and his founding of the National Afro-American League. This high point of agitation gave way to widespread resignation and acceptance around 1900. It was only in 1904, when I got out of the way, says Fortune, that Booker T. Washington came to preeminence. Fortune claims he was willing to help Washington, despite having had nothing in common with the policies that Washington endorsed, being rather the intellectual and political heir of the great Douglas. This telling of events is, of course, open to challenge at numerous points, but it is closer to being right than the more popular version of American history, which edits Fortune and his achievements out of the story completely. Looking over the melancholy, even tragic, story of T. Thomas Fortune, one can't help thinking that this man just couldn't catch a break. But the same isn't going to be true of this podcast. Like every year, we'll be pausing for the month of August. We'll return refreshed in September, and return also to a country that has not been in focus since episode 38, when we looked at the Baron de Vate. On September 6th, we'll be back in Haiti, exploring the anthropological and philosophical ideas of Antenne Firmin, as found in his treatise On the Equality of the Races. That's next time, though not in the next couple of weeks, here on The History of Africana Philosophy. I'm gonna tell God all